Since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution in the early 19th century, scientists believe man, as well as some natural effects, has increased world CO2 concentrations while at the same time world temperatures have increased. Is this causation or just coincidence? Before we look at the data, you will see that the left hand side of many of my charts does not say temperature, but a funny thing called temperature anomaly. Well, what is that? The anomaly is just the difference between measured temperature in that period and the temperature in some agreed upon base period. It's a way of normalizing the temperature readings. Using anomalies rather than actual temperatures allows scientists to more easily combine readings from many different parts of the world. Looking then at the world temperature anomaly for the last hundred plus years, we certainly see an increase, something like six tenths of a degree Celsius. Is this a lot or a little? Well, it depends on your perspective. People who want to make it look like a lot graph it this way, scaled as steeply as possible. However, compared to the 40 degree Celsius swings most places experience from summer highs to winter lows, the six tenths of a degree variation in the annual average is trivial. I have chosen for this film to scale it somewhere in between. So has this increase been due to CO2? Well, there's the rub, of course, because no one really knows, no matter how much they say they do. No one's temperature has two readings on it, one for normal temperatures and one for extra temperature from man-made effects. If we overlay worldwide CO2 concentrations over this temperature history, the fit is awkward. While CO2 increases steadily, temperatures actually fall from 1880 to 1910, and then again from 1940 to 1980. So while both have an overall increasing trend for the period, for over half the period, or 70 of the 120 years, temperature was going in the opposite direction from CO2 concentrations. Clearly, things are complicated. As with the ice core data, CO2 is not by itself the only factor at work. One of the problems we have is that man only really began measuring temperatures in any systematic way in the 19th century, which happened to be at the end of one of the coldest periods of the last millennium, called the Little Ice Age. We tend to make the anthropomorphic assumption that normal is what things were like when we began measuring. But few people think that the 19th century was necessarily normal, at least in the context of the last thousand years. This means that some of our measured warming the last 120 years is probably not man-made, but the result of a natural recovery from the Little Ice Age. In fact, most scientists attribute nearly all the world's warming before 1940 to just such natural effects. So to get at this issue of normality, scientists have tried to reconstruct the climate over the last 1,000 years from things like ice cores and tree rings. This is tricky work, full of potential errors. For example, how does one tell if a tree ring variation is due to temperature or some other climatic variation like precipitation changes? In the second UN IPCC climate assessment, this chart was a consensus view of the last 1,000 years of temperature. It included a medieval warm period as warm or warmer than today, and a little ice age where temperatures were much colder. Both of these effects are well documented in Western European historical records. After all, the Vikings gave Greenland its seemingly anachronistic name for a reason, and from the Little Ice Age we get tales of the Dutch routinely skating on canals that seldom froze before or after. But this chart was awkward for strong supporters of catastrophic man-made global warming theory. It made the temperature swings we have seen in the 20th century appear to be within the normal range of natural climatic variation. And the whole point of catastrophic man-made global warming theory is to blame man for driving climate past its natural limits. In the third assessment report, the UN named Michael Mann as its lead author for the chapter on historic temperature reconstructions. After scouring the worldwide body of climate opinion, he throw, chose to throw out this consensus view of temperature history in favor of his own reconstruction. This is often called the hockey stick because of its shape, and we'll not spend too much time on it because it's been so thoroughly discredited. Led by Canadians McIntyre and McKittrick, it has been shown that man's statistical methodologies were fundamentally flawed and tended to produce a hockey stick shaped curves even when fed random white noise. It had other flaws as well, but since his successors share the same flaws, we will deal with them in a moment. 
In the fourth IPCC report, the new lead author for this section was Keith Briffa, and after scouring the world of climate science, he chose his own work as the lead for the report. Do you notice any trends here? However, the UN tends to employ a special technique in their climate reports. When a chart like the hockey stick comes under fire, the IPC often chooses to try to increase confidence in the report by publishing 12 versions instead of just one. And indeed, having multiple studies getting at similar answers does tend to eliminate random errors and can build confidence if they come to a prob at a problem from different directions. But the world just doesn't have that many thousand-year temperature proxies. In this case, while there are 12 studies here, Many are using the exact same data from the same 40 or 50 trees, not to mention the same questionable statistical methods. If there are systematic errors with the ability of, say, bristlecone pine tree rings to act as a proxy for temperatures, then graphs like this are meaningless, whether we have 2 or 12 or 200 lines on them. But there are other fundamental problems with this graph. The study authors have all spliced together two different data sets, temperature proxies for older temperatures, and actual instrumental values for modern temperatures. The two data sets intersect only because they are forced to. Proxy data is scaled to match certain period in the modern surface temperature record. But you can see without the spliced on modern measurements, the black line, that temperature proxies themselves do not really form a hockey stick. It is only when the second data set is grafted onto the first that the chart becomes more frightening. But any good scientist should be very wary of an inflection point in the data that occurs at the exact point where two different data sources are spliced. The change in slope is much more likely to be due to mismatches in the data sources themselves than any real natural phenomena. And in fact, we have a few good reasons to suspect that the proxies are not a good match with measured surface temperatures, which we can illustrate by zooming in on the recent history a bit. Do you notice something odd? While surface temperature measurements leap upwards about a half a degree over the last several decades, the proxies hardly change at all. This tells us one of two things. Either the proxies are right, and the surface temperature measurements over the last 50 years are gross, being grossly exaggerated or biased by some effect, or it tells us the proxies tend to underreport temperature variations meaning that analyses like this one are telling a false story, showing far more temperature stability in the past than actually existed. Either way, it's a problem. By the way, we can learn a little about global warming science by studying one other element of this chart. See the light blue line there, the one that's cut off early? For some reason, this study's author seems to have cut off his data around 1950. Why is that? Well, it turns out that this particular study's proxies showed temperatures actually decreasing substantially after 1950. Rather than highlight to the scientific world that there was a potential disconnect in the proxy data, the author chose just to cut the data off and hide the problem. The study's author was Keith Briffa, the man the UN selected to be the lead author for this section of their climate assessment. So where does this leave us? We know that temperatures have increased.